fashion brands reinvented themselves to stay relevant. A multi-trillion dollar industry, fashion is first and foremost a business, with companies constantly looking for ways to diversify their customer base and increase their reach to ensure they make as much money as possible. Whether it's high fashion or fast fashion, staying relevant is no easy task and hinges on one's adaptability, which in most cases means it's out with the old and in with the new. In today's video, we're going to be taking a look at various fashion brands from Coach to Burberry to Crocs and examine how they've evolved over the years, specifically in regard to how they market themselves to the masses. Many of the brands we'll be talking about today have been around for decades, some even centuries. But for the sake of this video, we're going to be focusing on their evolution during the 21st century, as it's the era where we've seen the most changes in their marketing strategies because of the internet and social media. Let's get into it. Established in New York City back in 1837, Tiffany Young & Ellis was initially a stationery and fancy goods emporium before directing their focus towards jewelry in 1853, when they were promptly renamed Tiffany & Co. The business insisted on non-negotiable prices, a rarity at the time, and became known for their high-quality goods that came in a wide range of styles. These factors allowed Tiffany's to cultivate a brand image that gave clients the impression that they were superior to their competitors, and their products quickly became a status symbol, a concept that Tiffany's continues to utilize in marketing today. The brand found a permanent place in pop culture following the publication of Truman Capote's 1958 novella, Breakfast at Tiffany's, or more accurately, following the release of its now iconic 1961 film adaptation. Starring style icon Audrey Hepburn, the image of Holly Golightly eating a croissant in front of the Tiffany's display window and pining over the jewelry is instantly recognizable, and it elevated the brand's status amongst the public and made it a household name. Tiffany's. Worn on the necks of many of Hollywood's finest, Tiffany's became a point of reference in the jewelry world, and if you were buying diamonds, you were trying to get them from Tiffany's. While the brand had long been marketing themselves on glamour and exclusivity, they made an eventual shift in the 1990s by opening more stores in suburban malls and accommodating the affordable luxury craze with the release of their silver Return to Tiffany collection in 1997. Their now iconic silver toggle necklace was sold for $110, at the time at least, and opened the doors to a whole new generation of clientele who were finally able to afford Tiffany's, effectively breathing a new life into the brand. During the early 2000s, logomania was all the rage, reflecting the sense of excess that permeated all aspects of society at the time. And by boldly advertising where you'd bought it from, these return to Tiffany baubles became a must-have item for any young woman, whether you were 17 or 27. The necklace was worn by socialites like Paris Hilton, celebrities like Hilary Duff, and was featured in iconic movies like Legally Blonde and Confessions of a Teenage Drama Queen, making the item as synonymous with 2000s pop culture as flip phones or low-rise jeans. Despite their sales skyrocketing, people working at Tiffany's were nervous. Sure, these items were trendy now, but would the fad wind up alienating the brand's older and more conservative clientele? Would they no longer be seen as a luxury, but instead as something ordinary? Mark Aaron, Tiffany's vice president of investor relations in 2007, said of their popularity at the time, quote, some people would look at it one way and say, if every 16-year-old gets her silver jewelry from Tiffany, they'll eventually want their engagement ring from Tiffany 10 or 20 years later. But what if some of those teenagers fill up their jewelry boxes with Tiffany silver, and as they get older, they perceive Tiffany as where they got their teenage jewelry? This situation was a classic dilemma that every business has to face at one point or another. On one hand, diversifying your customer base is necessary to keep growing. And in order to do that, you have to experiment. But on the other hand, you don't want to lose your core buyers, the people who've been shopping with you for years. Because of their concerns about the brand's image and how they were being perceived by the public, Tiffany's began to hike up the prices on their popular silver jewelry, with the price of the Return to Tiffany necklace being increased to $250 by the end of 2004, more than double what it had cost when it was first released. Because of the price increases, along with the necklace becoming oversaturated, the craze began to die down by the middle of the 2000s, which actually wound up working in Tiffany's favor as it allowed them to maintain their luxury reputation that they'd spent decades cultivating. All's well that ends well, I guess. 
A brand that saw a similar rise in popularity during this time period, but with a far less positive outcome, was Burberry, who also reinvented themselves at the end of the millennium. Unlike Tiffany's, who created a specific line of products to entice new buyers, Burberry decided to beat them over the head with branding, putting the company's trademark Haymarket check on everything from bikinis to baby strollers to umbrellas. Founded in London in 1856, Burberry had long been the brand of choice for the upper crust of British society, allowing them to develop a prim and posh reputation. But in the 2000s, this came to a screeching halt when the brand grew popular with a different demographic, chavs. While the definition of what a chav is can differ, what is consistent is the negative perception of them, and more specifically, their supposedly lower class background. Chavs of the time period regularly flaunted designer goods, and Burberry's instantly recognizable check pattern was a large part of the look, which eventually led to it being widely counterfeited. Growing increasingly frustrated with the situation and not wanting anything to do with a group that were widely regarded as tacky, trashy, and tasteless, Burberry decided to backtrack, removing the check pattern from all but 10% of their merchandise by 2006 in the hopes that it would prevent the cheapening of the brand's image. Stuck in their ways, Burberry continued to focus on elitist and exclusionary marketing throughout the 2010s, using popular actors and models in their advertising campaigns who fit the brand's upper-class image. Failing to make an impact on millennials in the 2010s, the brand was overlooked by the populace in favor of other companies like Gucci who were trying to speak to young adults of the time. Despite Gen Z showing some interest in the brand, with photos of their Burberry kilt going viral regularly, Burberry's exclusive branding is holding them back, and if they don't make some changes soon, they'll be destined for obscurity. Having an item that could be flaunted on the arm of an it girl was what every brand wanted during the 2000s, and as a result we saw numerous luxury brands release bags specifically for that purpose. On the more expensive end of the spectrum were the Fendi Baguette and Dior Saddlebag, both of which made appearances on the influential show Sex and the City, giving the bags a stamp of approval that inspired many women to take the plunge and purchase them. On the other side of the spectrum was Louis Vuitton, who instead of creating a single bag in numerous colorways, focused on creating an instantly recognizable print that would stand out in a crowd. Collaborating with Japanese artist Takashi Murakami, they released the now iconic Cherry Blossom and Monogram Multicore in the mid-2000s, creating a full-blown Louis Vuitton craze. Coming in a wide range of styles and sizes, this release was geared towards the younger generation in the hopes of making them lifelong clients, and it seemed to be working, at least for a little while. When the economic recession hit in 2008, it not only drastically affected people's spending habits, but also how the fashion world went about its business. With flaunting one's wealth now being considered a social faux pas, monograms and blatant logos became a thing of the past, and the instantly recognizable cult items of the 2000s were pushed out in favor of minimalistic pieces and fast fashion. Unlike the past decade where they could convince young adults and teens to buy things simply because they were popular with celebrities, brands now had to be conscious of how much they were charging, which led to a boom in affordable collaborations between luxury brands and fast fashion retailers. H&M specialized in high-end, fashion-forward collaborations that people fought over, releasing sold-out collections with Versace in 2011, Maison Martin Margiela in 2012, and Balmain in 2015. By collaborating with Disney and Cheetos, Forever 21 focused on simple designs with nostalgic appeal and references to pop culture, allowing them to appeal to a younger demographic that had less disposable income. Target was the middle ground, collaborating with a wide range of brands that had a recognizable aesthetic in order to create the biggest variety of products, resulting in popular collections with Missoni in 2011 and Lily Pulitzer in 2015. Thrilling for me because now I don't have to go to the stores and, and, and try to steal it off the racks. I think it's made luxury available to people, and I think that's wonderful and very democratic, and I'm all for it. Now uh, every woman uh, gets to feel what it's like to wear uh, Versace. Younger people and people who can't afford uh, the real Magella, you know, to, to, to shop at H&M and to get to know the brand, and I think it's a great way to, to, to mix those both of those cultures together. Well, I mean, when I was a teenager, I wish I could afford Versace, so it's something that's going to be more affordable, and but it's still rich and it's still beautiful. I think it's exciting. I think it's wonderful for high fashion to make itself available to everyone, and that's the fun of it all. 
Based on their reactions during the 2000s, you would have thought that these luxury brands would be steering clear of these seemingly low-brow companies and clientele, but desperate times call for desperate measures. Besides these designs being cheaper and easier to produce, these retailers gave brands the opportunity to reach a wider audience without risk of damaging their brand image or alienating their core buyers. These collaborations allowed companies to appeal to three types of customers all at the same time. The first were the people who were already loyal to the brand and had more than enough money to spend, and they saw these collaborations as a discount of sorts. The second were fans of the brand who up until that point may have been unable to access or afford it. These collections gave them the chance to be included and create a positive association with the company. The third type were those completely unfamiliar with the brand, but who had the potential to become new clients. While these types of collaborations had their heyday during the 2010s, we continue to see them today, albeit with far more mixed reactions. Instead of affordable collaborations, the goal now is to create the most online buzz, clickbait if you will, as seen with recent over-the-top collaborations like Fendace or Gucciaga. These collaborations mimic the more is more era of the 2000s with bold logos and flashy designs, resulting in a look that is perfect for social media and little else. With the rise of hype beast culture, high fashion brands have also taken to collaborating with streetwear companies to appeal to both sets of clients, something that first became popular in 2017 with the Louis Vuitton Supreme collaboration, which became one of the most sought after collections that year. As we saw with their Murakami collab back in the 2000s, Louis Vuitton has always been on the lookout for a way to appeal to younger clients. And during the end of the 2010s, this was achieved through the creative vision of Virgil Abloh, who took over the menswear line in 2018. Described as, quote, Karl Lagerfeld for millennials, Virgil brought a modern flair to the brand by including streetwear elements in his designs, as well as changing their iconic logo to better appeal to 21st century consumers. The success of Louis Vuitton's rebranding has since prompted many other brands to focus on younger clientele, some more successfully than others. As previously mentioned, in the 2000s, celebrity culture was all the rage, proven by the rise of gossip magazines and reality shows, and those stars had the biggest influence on people's purchases of the time period. In the 2010s, we saw a shift because of the rise of social media, and it became less about who was wearing what and more about how often you saw it. Instantly recognizable items like the Valentino rock studs or the Hervé Leger bandage dress became popular on Instagram, Tumblr, and Pinterest, which coincided with these items' success in stores. Because of the influence social media had on customers, brands began to focus more on digital marketing, and content creators had just as much influence as celebrities. Today we see an even mix of both, with celebrities and influencers being used in marketing campaigns and sponsored posts in order to reach their respective fan bases. While many of the popular social media sites from the 2010s are still around, the new kid on the block, TikTok, has quickly become one of the most powerful and influential online platforms for young adults and teens due to its addictive algorithm and near infinite amount of content. Items that go viral on TikTok can sell out in mere hours, and many brands have attempted to capitalize on this by creating content that appeals to Zoomers. Now I'm sure you're wondering, why are companies so interested in Gen Z specifically? And the answer is pretty simple. First, they have decades of shopping ahead of them. They're the future of the industry, as opposed to boomers who are on their way out. Secondly, despite their age, their annual spending power in the United States alone is about $150 billion, only $50 billion less than millennials. Combined with their parents' income, Gen Z has proven that they're a force to be reckoned with. A brand that has seen an immense resurgence in popularity because of TikTok and Gen Z is Vivian Westwood, who's seen an 111% increase in sales in 2020. Founded in 1971, the brand has always been somewhat of an indie darling, largely due to its punk roots and anti-establishment imagery. Unlike other brands we'll talk about who made adjustments to their look or branding in order to appeal to Gen Z, Vivian Westwood's comeback was organic and a case of sheer dumb luck. With so many celebrities wearing archive fashion for red carpets, photo shoots, and in their day-to-day -day lives, 
Vivian Westwood corsets were spotted on numerous celebrities like FKA Twigs, Hailey Bieber, and Dua Lipa. But due to the high prices of these vintage items, they were hardly a reasonable purchase for the average consumer. But with the brand's increased amount of exposure online, as well as its inclusion in the popular anime Nana, people began to flock to more affordable items that featured Vivian Westwood's logo, specifically the pearl necklace, which became one of the most popular accessories of 2021. Worn by the likes of Madison Beer, Bella Hadid, Rihanna, and Kylie Jenner, many have called it the modern-day Tiffany necklace, and it's since become many people's introduction to the brand. Without having to do any marketing on their own, Vivian Westwood has found a whole new generation of loyal customers who are willing to walk around with their logo around their necks. Another high fashion brand that has found its way into the hearts of Gen Z is Marc Jacobs, with a luxury brand focusing a remarkable amount of resources into the demographic. Apart from its vintage designs going viral online, which have led to the re-release of items like the Ruth Loafers or Kiki Boots, the brand has also released collaborations with new age it girls like Devin Lee Carlson and Lauren Tsai, giving Marc Jacobs the opportunity to appeal to their fan bases. They've also employed quirkier and more eclectic imagery in their campaigns to help set them apart from other brands, as well as appeal to Gen Z's desire to be unique. The brand's most obvious attempt to cater to the younger generation is with the creation of their Heaven line back in September of 2020, which has since been worn by the likes of Iris Law, Olivia Rodrigo, and Dua Lipa. Featuring more affordable pieces in the main brand, Heaven is heavily inspired by the Gen Z aesthetic, featuring sweater vests, charm bracelets, baby tees, and tennis skirts. Collaborating with the likes of Doc Martens and Nodaletto, the popularity of the Heaven line reveals how fashion-forward this younger generation is, and how desperate they are to find a brand that truly understands them. If you've been paying attention to this video, or any other video we've released recently, then you've probably noticed the impact that the 2000s is having on today's fashion trends. And understandably, brands that were popular during that time period have been attempting comebacks. Uggs and Crocs, both of which developed negative connotations in the years following the height of their popularity, have been successful in these attempts. Both brands have had successful high-end collaborations, Uggs with Telfar and Crocs with Balenciaga, and in both cases the collaboration stayed true to the brand image while making updates that appealed to modern consumers. Both brands also benefit from the fact that their products are a perfect fit for a pandemic world, where to some people, being comfortable is just as important as being fashionable. In comparison, other 2000s brands like Baby Fat or Juicy Couture have struggled to adapt to the modern market. Instead of going the high fashion route, Baby Fat and Juicy Couture tried to jumpstart their revival with Forever 21 collaborations, likely in the hopes of profiting off of the brand's younger clientele and inexpensive production. However, this wound up alienating their original client base, who saw the new collection as cheap and a betrayal of the brand's image. Made up of simple graphic tees and generic tracksuits, the two collections are almost interchangeable with one another because of their cheap production value, something you definitely couldn't say about the brands during their heyday. Instead of creating something that could bring in both new and old consumers, they made something that didn't appeal to either, which is disappointing because both brands have the potential to thrive in the 2020s. With chunky and funky jewelry making a comeback, Juicy Couture should have released their own series of bracelets, necklaces, phone straps, and hoop earrings that could be customized with different charms. And with elevated loungewear sets becoming all the rage, they could have remade their iconic velour tracksuit in a more modern silhouette, the perfect thing for Zoom calls or grocery store trips. As for baby fat, they originally started off as a love letter to black streetwear, and there's no good reason why they couldn't update that idea for today. Imagine pastel miniskirts with matching cropped puffer jackets, bedazzled denim jumpsuits, or body-hugging asymmetric dresses with cutouts. See, that wasn't so hard, was it? An example of a brand that's managed to perfectly update itself for the times is Coach. Founded in 1941, Coach is categorized as a mid-luxury brand, offering quality leather goods at a more affordable price range. Although they struggled to find their footing initially, the brand found eventual success in the 90s and became a mainstay of the 2000s, with almost everyone owning something with a coach monogram at one point or another. Like many other logo-heavy items, the brand saw a dip in popularity following the 2008 recession, and struggled throughout the 2010s, something many blamed on the rise of other mid-luxury brands like Michael Kors or Kate Spade. But then, Coach got lucky. As teens in the 2020s developed an interest in 2000s fashion, Coach had a whole new clientele in their grasp, 
and not wanting to squander the opportunity, they went through a massive rebrand and redesign. To appeal to contemporary fashion trends, Coach released new designs like the Pillow Tabby, the Swinger Bag, and most recently, the Heart Crossbody. And the updates brought an air of sophistication, elegance, and glamour to the brand, effectively setting off a full-blown Coach renaissance. Meanwhile, their campaigns featured celebrities who could appeal to a wide range of new and old clientele, including Jennifer Lopez, who represented the middle-aged market, Paris Hilton, who drew in the millennials who'd grown up with her as a style icon, and Megan Thee Stallion and Ricky Thompson, who speak to the youth of today. These new ambassadors point to an important factor when it comes to revitalizing a brand for the modern age, accessibility, inclusivity, authenticity, and ethicality. Many members of this younger generation see themselves as activists, staying up to date on social and political issues and using this information to inform their purchasing decisions. For many brands, not just Coach, this has resulted in attempts to appeal to the modern sustainability movement. In Coach's case, they've begun selling vintage designs and upcycled products in the hopes of creating less waste. At least, that's what they say. While Coach's rebranding has successfully appealed to both new and old customers, Tiffany's has gone with a more controversial strategy to increase their sales. In July of 2021, they released their Not Your Mother campaign, which was intended to make the company appear hip and edgy. However, many of Tiffany's longstanding clientele took it poorly, calling the campaign everything from insulting to tone deaf, with some even saying that they would never shop at Tiffany's again. Now this anger isn't completely unfounded. After all, they've been the ones keeping Tiffany's in business all these years, and being passed up in favor of someone younger is never a good feeling. But it's also important to acknowledge that any brand unwilling to switch things up is destined for failure, and it was looking like Tiffany's was headed down that path. Combining this campaign strategy with the re-release of their Return to Tiffany's collection, it's clear that the brand is intent on profiting off of Gen Z's fascination with the past. But considering the necklace now retails for $800, I have to wonder what teens are actually going to be able to afford it. What brand do you think needs a marketing makeover? I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you soon. Bye!